Woodhouse Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram is bringing you more this holiday season. Finishing the year with big savings on the entire model lineup during the Wrap Up the Year sales event. Save up to $13,000 off MSRP on a 2024 Ram 1500 Crew Cab Laramie 4x4 for qualified buyers. Explore all our year-end lease and finance deals at WoodhouseCDJRBellevue.com or WoodhouseChryslerJeepDodge.com. This is Woodhouse. With approved credit, tax title, license, extra. When financed with Chrysler Capital, $299 dot fee due at signing. Stock number BC240134. Offer expires 12 31 2023 See dealer for details. You're listening to a CNA podcast. Welcome to this week's The Climate Conversations as we continue our Surviving the Sizzle series, exploring the scorching realities of heat waves and their profound impact on people in different sectors. I'm your host, Julie Yu, and in the third and final part of our series, we delve into a topic many of us are familiar with, our food. You might not have heard of this term before, but you soon will. Heatflation. That's when food prices soar as unprecedented heat waves affect our food sources. One woman has seen the impact of how intense heat has hurt her harvest. She's Rabia Sultan, a farmer from Pakistan who has a diverse range of crops, from sugarcane to mangoes and wheat at her farmland all while taking leadership roles in various boards related to agriculture. Rabia, thank you for joining us on The Climate Conversations. Thank you very much, Julie. Tell us about how you became a farmer in a male-dominated industry. That's a very interesting question. So being a child, I was from a rural background, but lived in the cities. So I was always connected with my farm, with my village. And I enjoyed the life, the environment, you know, the bond of people, the closeness. Mm. So I decided I want to take agriculture as a profession. Mm. So I discussed it with my father. Rather, I threw this idea on him. Mm -hmm. And initially, he was kind of, I wouldn't say skeptical, but like he, again, because it's a male-dominated society, Mm. and I being the youngest of the siblings, you know how the youngest child is treated. I wouldn't know because I'm the okay, eldest. Okay, <laughs> okay. The youngest child is generally not taken seriously and is always the baby of the family. So, you know, I said, I want to join the farms. Mm. He said, okay. But he was also very smart, I must say, that he put me in the most challenging and the most difficult crop, which is cotton. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> he was testing me. He was testing the waters, I think. Mm. And I remember when I came back from my first cotton spray, because cotton is sprayed with insecticide. Mm. I was, you know, I felt on top of the world. Suddenly it started to rain. Mm. And I remember I was pacing up and down the room and my father was sitting there quietly, sipping his tea, enjoying his biscuit. And I was, you know, fuming away. And I asked him, so do you realize the amount of time I spent spraying, the amount of money that has gone down the drain. He took a long pause, he sipped his cup of tea, enjoyed it, and he just asked me one thing. He said, can you do anything about it? That really irritated me then. But this one question has really helped me in my life, in my profession, that there are challenges which are beyond your control, So one has to improvise, regain uh, strength and move on. Mm. So here I am. And here you are. (laughs) Not just a farmer, but one of the top yielding farmer as well. But I would like to ask you, Arabia, you know, as a farmer in Pakistan, we know this country ranked eighth highest in the world to be affected by climate change related disasters. We are talking droughts, heat waves and massive flooding. But were you surprised by the frequency and the impact of the recent heat waves? Actually, I think it has happened sooner than, you know, we were expecting. At least I thought that climate change would not happen in my lifetime. Mm. But it has just hit us in our face. And, you know, farmers, it's not just Pakistan, but I think farmers across the globe are bearing the brunt of something that they are not responsible for. Mm. And every time, like you mentioned, that either it's drought, either it's flooding, because I've juggled between both. Mm. Flooding, 2010, 
Pakistan was drowned. Mm. I remember that night when it was all happening. I was surrounded by water. It was like an island. Oh, wow. And again, you know, I remembered my father's phrase, can you do anything about it? Because you cannot fight nature. Yeah. So the only thing that I could do was pray. Mm. The prayers were answered and luckily my farm was safe and there were people who were devastated. There were people who lost homes. Absolutely. And again, these heat waves that we faced last year, abnormal temperatures in the month of March and the season when you grow wheat yeah. for the grain to develop. You need cooler temperatures and normally the temperatures range between 22 mm. to 25 degrees Celsius spring for Pakistan. We faced 35 Celsius in March. Wow. And because of higher temperatures, I had less production, about 30%. Mm. So which means that if one farmer is getting 30% less crop multiplied by so many farmers across the country, it's a national loss. It's a loss at the level of the farm. Mm -mm. It's the loss at the level of the country. And because I also grow mangoes, I have a mango orchard. So because of the heat, the flowers shed. So again, there was less mango crop. So, you know, every time it's a new surprise, every time it's a new challenge. I wonder with so much of these extreme weather events, have food prices gone up? Food prices have gone up because of inflation. It is supply and demand, but not at the farm level as much as the retail level. Mm. So wheat is regulated by the government. So they fix a price for the crop. Okay. So the farmer gets less or about the same price mm. that the government has fixed for wheat. But mangoes, it's not regulated. So you get according to your quality of mangoes or that you grow. So these crop failures often mean financial losses that could take an emotional toll for many farmers. Have you had an instance where you face such hardships or anyone that you know that had to cope with them? And how difficult was it for them and their families? Yes, there are financial losses in case of these climate vagaries that the farmers have to face. The small farmers, because their spending is more, and so the cushion that they have is very thin. Mm. So yes, they bear the brunt. Then there are farmers that have bigger land holding. So their cushion is slightly better. But when prices crash, everybody bears the brunt according to the size of the pie. In previous episodes, I had a conversation with a wildfire fighter, a military general, who described to me just how dangerous it is for them to work and carry out their duties under such extreme heat. Tell us what farmers go through. I mean, the heat's impact on their health and also well-being during heat waves. Yeah, of course, when the temperatures soar, it becomes difficult because there is a limit for the human body to take that heat. Mm -hmm. So, of course, there are incidents of heat strokes, not feeling well, not able to put in that much. So, it has a toll on the farmers. They are not superhumans. Mm -hmm. And because there are no air conditioners in the field, so the air conditioner are the trees that we have in the field. So, yes, it becomes very difficult. <sighs> Electricity is another issue. There are power shortages. Of course. Doesn't mean that, you know, if you're sitting in a shade, the fan is also working. So, yeah, there are challenges. Mm -hmm. But farmers are resilient. They improvise. Yeah, improvisation is a good word because I hear reports of Vietnamese farmers planting crops at night because of increasing daytime temperatures. But Rabia, these harsh conditions can be tough on crops, right? Not only humans and farmers. What sort of measures have you implemented to adapt to rising temperatures and prolonged periods of extreme heat for your crops? Yeah, I'm on the learning curve because we learn every day. At least I learn every day mm. or I try to learn every day. So what I've done at my farm level is that I've started covering my soil with mulch. Mm. So mulch is type of a cover. You can do it organic leaves. You can have plastic mulches. You can cover it with leaves. You can cover it with wooden chips. You can cover it with anything. Basically, the idea is to cover the soil so the temperature of the soil remains constant. Oh. 
and it cools the soil and moist it retains more water it keeps it moist mm. so you will require less water less irrigation and you kind of create an environment on the top soil and beneath mm. so all the fungi and all the activity that is going beneath the soil it also helps nourish the crops so that is one way of conserving the soil and saving it from the high temperatures heat then i've started using micro irrigation or we call it high efficiency irrigation drip or sprinkler irrigation to use the layman terms mm, i see again i'm trying to reduce the carbon footprint so i've started using solar panels at my farm Mm. So these are some things that I've done. Mm. There's a lot more that needs to be done and I feel that we need to have more climate justice and we need the developed world to help the farmers when it comes to technologies to raise their crops better mm. because this is a global issue this is not an issue with South Asia or one specific region. So if farmers have access to research behind those technologies mm. I think that's going to help the globe do agriculture more sustainably. Hello everyone. My name is Steven Chia and I'm host of CNA's weekly news podcast Heart of the Matter. Each week my job is to ask the questions you have like why is the COE so high? Why on singles dating or what's going on with the red hot property market in Singapore? If you want the views behind the news, then tune in each week as we get to the heart of the matter. We are on the CNA and Me Listen apps and wherever you get your podcasts. Hit follow or subscribe so you don't miss an episode when it drops. I also noticed that you grow quite an extensive range of crops like sugarcane, mangoes and wheat. How do you decide on the mix of crops to cultivate? How does this sort of diversity help you manage the risks associated with heat waves and changing climate conditions? As they say never put eggs in one basket. <laughs> Wise words. <laughs> so, I try to put eggs in different baskets mm. because there are different seasons, there are different crop cycles. Yeah. So, that's how we choose and so we have crop rotations. I have cotton and that is replaced by wheat mm -hmm. and so this circle goes on. Sugarcane, it's a 3 year crop but I harvest it each year. Mm. And mangoes, you know, are orchard so you know you plant them and you know they are with you for the rest of your life and their life. Mm -hmm. And as much as you look after them, they look after you. So orchards are like nurturing your own children. Mm. So you prune them, they grow with you. <laughs> you tell them what's right, what's not right. Mm. I've also experimented with ultra high density mangoes. which is that you have more mangoes in the same area mm. like if you are growing 100 mangoes in one hectare you will grow 800 mangoes in the same piece of land mm. this year i had some fruit from the orchard but next year it will be at a commercial level mm. so this year was the first fruit so i thoroughly enjoyed it we often hear reports of genetically modified crops or seeds that require less water to grow or that are more resistant to diseases or pests how have they been could they be the game changer in terms of enhancing yields quality and tolerance yes a seed is the most important thing after water for agriculture mm. so yes when you have better quality seeds when you have seeds that have a specific characteristics specific traits and now you can actually modify the crop the seed to require less water mm. you can have drought tolerant crops we had this green revolution and especially in wheat mm. the scientist of united states norman borlaug he developed this wheat variety and ever since then each year they develop new varieties mm. and they have helped because world population is growing we have to feed more mouths and the soil is the same land mass is not changing mm. so of course technology has helped in this now we talk of digital agriculture mm. when i started farming we could never understand that sitting at home you can also monitor the crops you can monitor the 
fields by drones, you can monitor the fields by digital agricultural technologies. Mm -hmm. You had to be in the field physically. Mm -hmm. Even now you have to be physically present, but still, you know, you can monitor how much water, how much fertilizer, when to spray, how to spray. Sure. So, you know, this is all technology which is helping farmer. So we need to bring in this technology, more of it in our part of the world for it to be efficient and for it to be helpful for the farmer. So Rabia, looking ahead, what are some of the biggest challenges you anticipate facing as farmers? The biggest challenge is water Mm. because water is a finite source. Water is scarce. And in Pakistan, we have about 75% of our water is through canal irrigation that are built on the rivers. In fact, our irrigation system is a very unique system. Mm -hmm. So our water resources are the glaciers. When glaciers melt in summers, the water comes into the rivers and then into the dams and onwards into the canals and to the farms. Mm -hmm. So with the rising temperature, The researchers and tough scientists say that the main river, which is the Indus River in Pakistan, is going to dry up. So that's a serious concern. Mm -mm. I may not be alive then, but there will be farmers. Agriculture has to continue. So that is one of the serious challenges and threats to the agriculture. Mm. And I hope it doesn't happen, but you know, it's science, it's reality. And at the pace at which the technology is moving in the developed world, we should go towards precision when you exactly know when to apply water, how much. So farming is all about planning, is all about using the resources sensibly and using the resources in the right way. So that leads me to my last question. So Rabia, what kind of support policies or initiatives would you like to see from the government and other institutions to help farmers like you in dealing with the impacts of heat waves or climate change? The most important thing is that we need constant consultations. We need to ask the wearer of the shoe where it pinches. Mm. Policies generally are made somewhere else. But regarding climate change, farmers' preferences need to be taken on board because it's a very complex issue. It's a very complicated issue. So we need the policymakers and the farmers to sit together and they need to develop the prescription. And we need the ag companies to pitch in here. They have products to mitigate the climate change issues, whether it's drought, whether it's heat stress, but there needs to be collaboration of the policy makers, the implementers, and eventually the farmers. Yeah, all hands on deck, right? Aravia, well, thank you very much for shedding the light on this extraordinary efforts made by farmers to you know, adapt to a change in climate and working towards a more resilient future for agriculture. Thank you very much for your time and good luck. Thank you, Julie, for having me over. Well, thanks to my guest and thanks to everyone for tuning in. I hope you enjoy this episode. Now, do remember to like and subscribe to this podcast so you know when the new episode drops. Leave us a message on Spotify or Apple Podcasts to let us know what you think. The team behind this podcast is Cyan Nguyen, Jacqueline Chen, Joanne Chen, Tiffany Ang, Crispina Robert, and Namjuli Yu signing off.